1935, the first of a new generation of tanks shows up in Sweden. Landsverk were taking a look at their L10 and decided to tweak it a little bit. Now, they had built precisely three of these things in Swedish service, the M31. But the vehicle that they ended up with, well, the general concept is still around today. So we are back at Arsenalen in Sweden. It's about an hour west of Stockholm. Thank you to the patrons who have funded this little trip. And well, let's start having a look with firstly the M38 model, and then we'll move on a little bit from there. From straight on at the front, you can see the characteristic narrowness of Swedish designs. Although in fairness for 1935, basically everything that was coming out was narrow, just the Swedes decided over time to keep with that rule. Don't let all these various bolts at the front fool you. That is simply to remove the armor plate to access the transmission system. The vehicle itself is generally welded. And as such, and this by the way followed on from the L10, uh, it was very lightweight for its structural rigidity. And basically nobody else is doing this. Only the Panzer I really was the other welded tank of 1935. That was also only just entering production. And when we go around the rest of this vehicle, you see that when you compare the L60 to the Panzer I, it's night and day. Features on the front otherwise, well, of course, you've got your towing or lifting mounts, ventilation a little bit for the powertrain. The main service headlight is this one in the middle. So on the sides, you've got little low intensity lights that are hey, basically really more just so you can see where the tank is as opposed to the tank itself seeing out and there's even a little reflector underneath. But your main single service headlight is behind this armored shroud. And of course the armored shroud has shutters which kind of filter the light downwards a little bit, reducing visibility of the vehicle from above or from the air. This frame up here, this is a rest for the driver's hatch and I'll open up the driver's hatch a little bit. It's kind of an interesting design. Moving further forward to the side, forgive me. You'll see that the driver's position has a number of periscopes and a direct vision block with an armored shutter at the front. This is another novelty feature for 1935. Up until then, basically vehicles had vision blocks, direct vision or slits. Now you're talking about proper periscopes. Final drive housings, you can see the bolts around here, and well, basically that's it on this particular vehicle. So, quick hop around to the side. Coming around to the side, first thing you see, of course, is going to be the large sprocket wheel. Now, although it's large in diameter, it is not particularly large in terms of width. There's not very much distance between the two sets of teeth. You will see, of course, that they mesh in with the equally thin track. So again, equally thin by today's standard, not so much by the time. They're single pin and the pins appear to be held in place by end caps that got beaten into place or on each side. So it looks like you need a pin basher to take them out again. As is typical with a lot of vehicles, the sprocket wheels are bolted uh, with teeth bolted onto the wheel, I'm sorry. And the idea behind this is that, well, these things wear down from time to time and it's a lot easier, or if they break or snap or whatever, it's a lot easier to simply replace the tooth ring than it is the entire sprocket wheel. The wheel itself, as you can see, is lubricated. If access points, uh, two large ones on each side and a grease nipple for the hub itself right in the center there. You can see the length of the center guides on this and the idea of having the long center guide is it is less likely that your road wheel will pop off the track. So far so good as far as it goes but have a look even when you just look at the curvature of this little curve from the front slope to the wheel you can see that the tips and the center guides are basically touching already. So you can imagine how it wouldn't take all that much for the two center guides to hammer against each other if you have a, a you know, suitably uneven ground. The wheels stamped four road wheel pairs per side. And this is where we get into the difference between the L60 and the previous L10. L60 has torsion bars. 
Now, there was great debate as to who came up with the idea of torsion bar suspension for tanks. Was it the Swedes? Was it the Germans? Even Barnes in the US has a patent on the things. But when it comes down to actually putting one into a production vehicle, off the top of my head sitting here, this is the one that comes out first. Possible there were a couple of prototypes as well, and they, my knowledge is not entirely all-encompassing. Anyway, so road wheels on torsion bars, fantastic. So they don't take up too much room inside the vehicle. They take up, a, they still take up a reasonable percentage, all things considered, but not too much. And they are very good suspension systems. Now the first and the fourth road wheel pair per side also have the shock absorber systems. Every swing arm also comes with a bump stop. Moving a little bit more to the rear, Two return rotors, again with grease nipple. This is all fairly modern. Even you can see the hubs on the road wheels have grease nipples for the lubrication system. And if you will recall when I did that Convoy to Remembrance, the preparation work I did on the M60, which is also a torsion bar welded vehicle, even then there's a grease nipple on the road wheel they have to pump the grease into. So they, these guys are definitely ahead of the curve. Just above you have the jack, Pioneer tools, way at the top there you can just make out the base of the radio antenna, which is in the turret. Hmm, where will I see that in ooh, a few years in most other countries? The Swedes are really ahead of the game here. At the very end is, well, it's not really a trailing idler, it's on the ground in this uh, vignette here, simply because the vehicle is raised up, but if it's on level ground, it's not in contact with the ground. However, because of the likelihood in situations like this, I mean, this isn't exactly a significant off-road uh, obstacle, the idler wheel will contact the ground, and as a result, it is on suspension of its own. So it has a swing arm, it has a bump stop, in addition to the extension system for tensioning the track. Now, over the years, of course, the Swedes would play around with the location of this idler wheel, but uh, in the L60, it generally maintains this fairly low position. So, I hear you say, how does one tension a track on an L60? Well, I'm glad you asked. See this little grease fitting here? That's not it. It is on a modern tank like an M1. This is simply lubrication so that when you do start applying physical force, it actually is a bit easier than on most tanks. Remove the locking clamp here and attach your large spanner to the bolt. Very common system, this large bolt. Now what is a little bit less common is that there's a safety pin. And if the track encounters such obstacles that it starts to stretch beyond the ability of the system to, to compensate, the thinking is that this shear pin will break first before the track overstretches. And the thinking is that, well, it's a lot easier to replace the shear pin and then retension the track again than it is to replace a snapped track. So when the shear pin snaps, the tension system will collapse inward, give you a lot more slack in the track. Moving towards the middle, well, you got the muffler system for the two exhaust pipes, one on each side, the rather unique sort of uh, towing hook. So you take your towing eye, pull it all the way around. So the theory is that it's very unlikely that you know, even under slack conditions that the your cable is going to unhook itself. There is a traditional pin tool for towing in the middle. If you look up, you'll see that there are louvers here for the ventilation system uh, behind the spare track link. The spare tracks are held in place by these little hinged uh, retainers and you can see at the top that some of the pins don't have those retaining clips that I was talking about that hold the pins in place so I'll, I'll put an insert shot zoomed in on that. This here is a connector for the cold weather starting system. You have an external component, I guess I call it a primer for lack of a better term, heats up coolant which then gets pumped into the engine compartment and you have a warmer engine to help you start more easily. Next to that is a single tail light. Moving under here behind this little protective cover is where you insert your hand crank. The engine on this vehicle is located offset to the right. I'll show you that in a moment. 
and underneath the bottom here that is where you would access your oil filter coming around to the far side the sponson bin nice to have still which is one on the other side as well i just didn't mention it as it went by the engine deck is smooth on it there's not actually all that much there's a fuel filler port on the far side uh, so you can access the fuel tank without lifting up the entire engine deck cooler ports forward and well this little locking system here one on each side simply get this out of the way and the entire engine deck will hinge up and forwards under the engine deck is the Scania Vabis 1664 it's a 7.7 .7 liter six cylinder inline water cooled puts out about 142 horsepower as you can see it's located a little bit off under the right hand side leaving room on the left hand side for the fuel tank and the oil tank for the forward you can make out the radiators the fan is directly to the rear of the engine so the air gets drawn in from the extreme rear forward and then through the radiator grill up at the front as far as engines go it's not really all that complicated the drive shaft moves directly forward the transmission you'll see will be on the right as well so like a uh, fair few tanks at the time the offset drivetrain means that the crew get to go on the left I'll also call your attention to these two automatic fire extinguishers in the engine compartment as well it's about every time you go over this feature on the L60 it's a, oh it's another modern feature that they have Something that I haven't done, although I probably should, is you'll see on the left-hand side there's actually a support strut so you can have the engine deck only partially up for access instead of uh, having to rest it against the turret as I've done here. Moving further forward around to the side, well, I'm going to draw your attention to the visors which are located on the turret side, forward and a little bit more to the side and apparently they do vary over the years so looking closely at the visor it'll tell you a little bit more about the sub variant of the vehicle then pass more of the uh, maintenance tools pickaxe and tanker bar looks a little bit different to a traditional tanker bar but you know it's a tanker bar from the shape of it a bit more sponsor and stowage i'll note the hook and loop here for the uh, crane if you have to pull the turret and then further forward the wing mirror now this is only found on the right hand side there's not one on the left and i said well why don't you want the, to look at the left and the chap standing next to me here reminded me that sweden used to be right hand drive territory and they only switched in the 60s so back when this vehicle was around if you were going to be overtaken you wanted to pull out into traffic you wanted to see make sure there's nothing coming you'd be looking at your right mirror so there you go the minor detail that i i have to say i completely forgot finally for part one well the turret exterior simple single piece forward folding hatch of copious size i should add a folding pintle for the 6.5 millimeter machine gun if you wish to mount one another lift attachment for the crane when you want to pull the turret housing for the optic radio mount on the left rear of the turret i've mentioned earlier and a padlock for securing your tank at night make sure nobody gets in and nicks anything uh, it simply hooks into the lid here and we're still using this today my three million dollar tank is secured with a three to five dollar padlock so anyway that's pretty much it for part one and well guess what Part two, we go inside, and let's see if I manage to fit into an L60. So, I hear you ask. So, I hear you say, just how does one tension the track on an L60? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
So the next thing that comes out of your mind is, well, how do you tension the track on an L60? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, I hear you say, how do you tension the track on an L60? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, I hear you say, how does one change? So, I hear you say, how does one tension the track on an L60? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, you say you. So, I hear you say, how does one tension the track on an L60? Well, I'm glad you asked. Oh, it would also help if I recorded. So, I hear you say, just how does one actually... So, I hear you say, how does one tension the track on an L60? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, I hear you say, how does one tension the track on an L60? Well, I'm glad you asked.